Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, fifth iteration of the Strategic Farming Program, Let's Talk Crops. Uh, we're happy you guys have joined us today. Um, today, again, our topic today is third crops ready to work for you. And with us today, we have uh, two University of Minnesota professors in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Joachim Wiersma, who is the Extension Small Grain Specialist, as well as uh, Dr. Craig Schaefer, who is a uh, faculty member and um, and a forage specialist as well. These sessions are brought to you by the University of Minnesota Extension, and we have generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. Uh, my name is Jared Goplin. I'm an Extension educator. I work primarily with forage and small grain crops, so get the pleasure to work with Joachim and Craig uh, quite often. And, uh, but for today's session, uh, there's a few housekeeping items we wanna go over. Uh, the first is just that this, these are really meant to be more discussion-based format uh, sessions. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes of more formal presentation at the beginning, and then uh, really it'll be uh, more based on open discussion. So please uh, feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your mouse around the bottom of that screen, you should see a Q&A uh, button. If you click that button, type that question in and uh, hit enter, and it'll, it'll allow us to see those questions and and, uh, and keep the discussion going. There is also a chat box. We, we ask that you don't use the chat box for questions. Please use the Q&A box. And, uh, but if you do have any technical issues, feel free to, uh, to let us know through that chat box. I guess another final uh, note is there is a very short three question survey, very painless at the end of these sessions. So when you log off and click leave meeting, uh, there is a very short survey that we, we ask everybody to, to please take. These sessions will be recorded, and uh, if you want to come back and reference at a later date, they will be uh, soon available on uh, the University of Minnesota Extension website. So with that, I thank you for attending, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Joachim Wersma. Okay, everybody see that, hopefully? Um, let's see if I make the rest of the technology now work. Um, cereal crops for grain and cover, mostly grain. So last week, um, I was asked to give a talk at the best of the best, and I talked about climate weirdness, and I'm borrowing a little bit for, of that for uh, this talk. Um, I know it's a controversial subject, but it's happening, I think, and so let's look at that, what it's currently doing for us in Minnesota. So if you look at the climate projection for Minnesota, we're going to be warmer, we're going to be wetter, and that has changes our growing season. Um, and it's not equally distributed. Um, we're going to see a more pronounced effect on the daily minimum temperatures uh, than we're going to see on the maximum temperatures each day, uh, especially during the winter months. And in the summer, uh, we're going to see that effect even larger on the minimum daily temperatures because we have a lot more water vapor in the air. Um, surprisingly, uh, the projections have it that we're gonna have cooler and wetter starts of the growing season. Um, and we're gonna have more severe, what Mark Seeley always uh, lovingly refers to as wetter singularities really massive thunderstorms that dump four plus inches. Um, on a particular spot and then just down the road, they might get nothing. To put it in, in simple terms, we're going to be like Iowa, Missouri, and parts of eastern Kansas uh, are today. What that means for our growing season? Well, our CO2 concentration, ambient CO2 concentrations are now 400 parts per million. They've never been this high, and that actually is advantageous for three spe C3 species, soybeans, wheat, uh, sugar beets, less so than they are for corn species. Uh, for corn, uh, not as a species, basically corn. Um, we're going to have a longer growing season that is actually weighted towards the end of the growing season. We're going to have those higher dew points which are disadvantageous for cool season annuals like wheat compared to warm season annuals like soybeans and corn. And we're gonna have this higher risk of flooding and drown out. So I start playing with data and the reason for it, I, A, I like playing with data, um, 
but I was looking at whether or not these trends that are projected, we can already pick up in, in how many days we can actually get around the farm. And NAS reports days suitable for field work in their weekly progress report. And so what I did was two steps, regress the cumulative recorded number of field days within each year. And I recorded the, basically the intercept, the slope and the residual mean square error. And I won't bore you with all the details in 10 minutes of why I did that. But then I took the second step and took those individual values in each year um, and regressed that over years. And that gives us a little bit of idea of what happens in a season. So this is uh, since 1995 when they start reporting it. And I wish they had gone back all the way into the 60s and 50s, but they don't. Um, and you can see that from 1995 through 2005, we had very average years, you know, right around 4.7 days per week during the growing season. Then we had a, have had a couple of years from 2005 to 2013 where we were trending above. And since 2015, we've been trending below that line. In other words, we've had fewer on average days suitable for field work since per week since 2015. If you look at the residual mean square error, we see a downward trend for the whole season. What that means is, if you interpret it, that periods of favorable conditions and favorable for un unfavorable conditions are rapidly following each other. So a couple of good days, then a, little, a stretch again where we can't be in the field. A couple of good days, then a stretch we can't be in the field again. Uh, as opposed to long periods uh, of really good conditions alternated by long periods where we couldn't be in the field. An example of that would be like 2011 and 2013. If you look at the fall, something interesting has happened. Even though we're predicting longer falls and that is already showing, uh, it's now very routine to have days suitable for field work reported all the way to the end of November. What we're seeing is that the average number of days per week is declining. Likewise, we see that similar pattern since 2013, where um, we have alternating wet and dry, wet and dry, wet and dry. So interpretation, it doesn't look like our whole season is changing, uh, for days suitable for field work. Um, and the number of days in the spring actually seem to be trending up a little bit uh, compared to what we saw in the fall. And this alternating wet dry cycle um, seems to be relatively pronounced at this point in time. So bottom line, uh, you have less time to cover more acres. And why is that important? Well, the early bird still gets the worm especially for wheat, sugar beets, corn. The final quality of certain commodities matters more than for others. In the case of wheat or barley, um, dry beans, you know, the buyers have very specific demands of that commodity that you're bringing in. And you are guys are still getting larger. So how do you manage that? Well, we do it like you doing it, the same way you've always done it. We still apply the economies of scale. Your equipment is getting bigger. Your equipment is getting faster. The challenge with that eventually is gonna be that physics and logistics are gonna create upper bounds, which means that you would have to buy multiple pieces of the same equipment. Um, and there is a point where you actually have too much equipment. Um, the other problem is, once you get more than one piece of equipment, you have to find qualified labor and that is getting scarcer and scarcer. Right now, I don't know if you saw it in the press, um, there's, we might not get all the South Africans because of COVID-19 variant that is in South Africa. The H2 visas uh, right now are held up, which means that you're not gonna get that qualified labor. So what is another solution? 
And now we're coming back to why I included this. It's called economies of scope. And that's called diversification. It's using the same equipment uh, on other parts of your operation. It's called crop rotation. And that means cereals for grain. And why do I talk cereals? Well, for you as a producer to manage that risk, you need to have a set number set of tools. And one of those is, is viable markets and markets where you can actually in a way manage that risk, which means you have to have a futures market. And so winter cereals, if indeed we're gonna stay wet and dry of longer falls, wetter springs, I should say, um, and overall warmer temperatures and wetter growing conditions, we probably eventually gonna to switch to winter cereals, especially in Southern Mint. Hybrid rye and winter wheat might be very good options compared to the spring cereals in that case, if you're gonna add a crop into your rotation. Um, an ideal rotation then would be indeed corn, soybeans, and then a winter cereal. And that has tremendous benefits for corn. One of which would be the water budget. Um, you have a period where you can do uh, improvements to the land like drainage, which is gonna be more important um, in the future, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that crop rotations work. We also have learned, and which is why we have the corn soybean system in the US, um, that corn really only needs a one year break. But all the other crops, doesn't matter, soybeans or any of the cereals need at least two years. So I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time, but this is the sale, blatant sales pitch. To move away from those economies of scale, that sing, single enterprise frame of mind that keeps your banker happy, we might have to move to a systems approach to keep the production system happy. And so what do I propose? You can fill in the blank there. Uh, one more time, what am I proposing? So with that, I'm gonna show you a very little, little bit of data. Uh, this is hybrid rye variety of basically the rye variety trial as is published by the Ag Experiment Station. And the hybrid rye and KWS is one of the purveyors. You know, we're looking at yields in excess of 120 bushels per acre um, in the trials. In some cases, we take 150 bushels. Um, it's, we're still learning a lot about hybrid rye, including, and we're trying to get this research funded for how to manage the fertility on it because it's a winter cereal. Um, when do you apply that nitrogen? Do you do it all in the fall, et cetera? But hybrid rye has potential. And the benefit of rye is that we're starting to get work on not just as a food use, but also as a feed use. And that's important for you to manage that risk. Uh, winter wheat is a little bit, you know, there's more varieties, um, but winter wheat too, this past year, for instance, did very well. We had a decent spring and that makes a big difference. And we have yields that are in excess of 100, and 100 bushels per acre. So with that, I'll stop um, and stop sharing my screen and switch over to Greg Schaefer. Thanks, Joachim. And before we do uh, jump over, uh, obviously small grains and integrating small grains into the rotation, especially for you know those of you who maybe don't have much experience uh, doing that, we do have uh, some virtual small grain workshops coming up here in a couple of weeks. I'll put the link in the chat, but if you wanna uh, really spend uh, basically two full hours uh, really talking about this in more detail, that's that's probably really the, the place to go to, to really talk more on the nuts and bolts in terms of, of infield management uh, of some of these small grains. So I'll put and that link in the chat, feel free to register. And one uh, more, with that. One more comment. Did you see the background from Derek there? That's spring wheat. That's 85 bushel spring wheat this past season. Why was it 85 bushels? And it's in Yellow Medicine County. And why 85 bushels? Planting date. That's the big one. Even us poor guys in Western Yellow Medicine County can grow decent wheat once in a while. 
All right, well, with that, we'll turn it over to, to Dr. Craig Schaefer, who will have, uh, I think, a few more slides to share with us on uh, some other crops and ideas. And again, a quick reminder, you know, as we're going through these presentations, feel free to use the Q&A box. It'll, it'll bank those questions uh, so that they pop up for us later. If you're like me, you always forget what your question was by the time you get to the end. So feel free to type them in uh, when they're fresh in your mind. So um, hello there, everybody. Can everybody see this? So I'm gonna cover uh, several different types of crops very rapidly here within the 10 minutes, not showing you a lot of data, hoping this will stimulate some discussion. I start out uh, pictures of some grazing cattle as well as some alfalfa. And I'm doing this because these are the crops I've worked with traditionally over my career. Um, but we all know right now that alfalfa although uh, and perennial grasses, although they're great crops um, and they contribute a lot to the environment, um, there are marketing issues about how do we get that to a market and get rewarded for growing it. Okay, I wanna start talking off just a little bit about cover crops um, and some of the work I've done. Uh, this is the, uh, a publication by the Minnesota uh, Pollution Control Agency showing the uh, Minnesota Nutrient Reduction Strategy. And they point out that there is a need for more living cover uh, on the landscape, particularly uh, following or early harvest crops in corn and soybeans. And we've also seen uh, on various publications, this kind of uh, a write up about cover crops, boosting soil health. Um, so these are, have been uh, talked a lot about uh, these days, just to show you pictorially what this means um, in this period from October to Ju June, usually early June, um, there's not a lot of ground cover. And the idea be you'd cover those with something, maybe with the hybrid rye that Yoakum talked about. Well, I've worked um, with my uh, cooperator um, and uh, fellow colleague, um, uh, Krishona Martinson to look at various cover crops. And um, we've actually looked at them under horse grazing. Horses have a unique way of grazing. They're very picky, maybe pickier than beef or sheep. Uh, but we wanted to look at the feeding value of these um, crops. So we planted a number of different species here. Um, on the bottom left, you see the daikon radish, which is called groundhog radish. On the right is a purple top turnip. Um, and uh, we've, we evaluated those. Um, got some really great pictures of, of horses uh, eating, eating these things. Horses do not particularly like to eat the turnips or the radishes. They prefer to have the grasses. Like in this particular trial, we had annual ryegrass and we had winter rye. Here is some, um, the result of some grazing all around on to the right, you can see the turnips um, uh, or the radishes can't quite make it out. But in the middle of the picture that's grazed down is annual ryegrass. So, we concluded from this, if you want something that horses will eat and, and beef animals will eat and really is high in quality, then plant the annual ryegrass. Clovers work really good in this scenario too. But we also looked at various small grains as well. If I should interject something. These were all planted following spring wheat in middle of August. That's why they look so good. They had a long growing period. Here's some spring oats. And um, the um, kind of a before and after grazing. Uh, horses didn't particularly relish the oats, but um, maybe we didn't have enough grazing pressure on those. But <coughs> the big cover crop that we've heard about is cereal rye, uh, the winter rye. And that's the one that's uh, um, been proposed and talked about by various agencies. And um, we got to contend that this is a great winter cover crop. It's probably the one that we can plant the latest uh, fits into our system, but there's issue about the grain markets for it. And Yoka might want to talk about that. And also want to make the point that spring management can be challenging. And my real um, concern about proposing cover crops for Minnesota 
is shown in this graph. This was some work done, see published in 2006, but it's still relevant today. Um, and it shows reduction in drainage, tile drainage, nitrates, um, as a response to planting rye on these different planting dates, 15th of September to the 30th of October, and looking at the reduction over time. So if you plant, let's say, the 15th of October, that's the triangles, go across and look at the reduction. And then by the 30th of May, you're talking maybe about a 20% reduction. To get close to a 30% reduction, and have, which would be kind of a minimum reduction we would want to have, you're going to have to plant by the 15th of September. And then you could take it off in about the uh, end of April, first part of May. So just think about this in terms of the current cropping system and um, where we harvest corn or soybeans into October. And then in the spring, we wanna plant these crops in Southern Minnesota, the central Minnesota as early as we can. Um, and let's just say early part of May. What is the real value of a cover crop in that scenario? It doesn't fit very well. In my opinion, uh, I propose this system, which um, I'll tell you a little story about it. Plant uh, harvesting, plant hybrid corn first of May, harvesting by 15th of September. Uh, no till the rye in, do fall strip tillage, and then the following spring, kill the, the rye, and then plant the uh, soybean into the strips. I was with some farmers um, when I proposed this, harvesting corn by the 15th of September and the, a farmer said, you're crazy. Uh, you're not a farmer, I can see that. Um, because if we do that, we're gonna use, lose yield and I'm gonna lose my farm. And I'm not gonna lose my farm just to have a cover crop planted. Um, so um, this was, I was making a proposal to have my research funded and for some reason then it didn't get funded, but <laughs> that's a story. So this is a picture from Pennsylvania where winter wheat is planted and they've got a much uh, longer growing season there, works out well. Um, and uh, maybe with the climate change that uh, Yoakum is proposing, Someday we'll be able to have winter wheat planted and reliably have it over winter. Some other topics. Uh, this is some work we're doing on uh, legume cover crops. Harry Vetch and P were trying to develop these to reliably overwinter. So we're talking about a winter pea and uh, Harry Vetch. And there's a picture here in your right, the circle with some nodules on some vetch plants. And I think you can pick out the, the peas and the vetch. Hairy vetch in particular is a crop that we've made some real progress on. It has a lot of nitrogen fixation potential. Uh, it needs to have a little improved winter hardiness. And we're hoping that by growing it in the cropping system, fall planting it, till it in the spring, we can also add nitrogen. Finally, I want to say something about kerns and maybe a lot of you've heard about it already. It's a perennial grain crop, and it's a crop that I think really can fit in to um, uh, crop rotations, would be strategically placed on landscapes. Um, it's got a tremendous root system, large seeds, tolerant to a wide range of conditions. Here's what it looks like in the field. And if you've ever grown a field of quack grass, you look at this, you'll say the inflorescence is about the same. Here's the some of the seed and the uh, <coughs> inflorescence. It's quite small, about a third of a size of wheat. So there is a plant breeding program going on, but led by Jim Anderson uh, and Prabin to increase grain size. There's been a tremendous effort for commercialization. Here's some long root ale, which was uh, produced from the grain, Patagonia provision. 
and other types of products has been made as well. We've also looked at it as a forage, forage source. And the model here is to graze it in the spring, harvest the grain, and then graze it in the fall, as shown here as, as, as we did at Morris. So there's a lot of potential here, um, we think, for Kernza. It's um, in the early stages of development. There was a new variety released through the Forever Green Initiative um, and uh, through the plant breeding program by Dr. Anderson uh, by the name of Clearwater. We're trying to get that out on the landscape. If you are interested in Kernza, here are two sources. If you're interested in growing it, uh, contact Colin at the bottom. He can tell you more about the details of it. So that's it. Jared? Thanks, Craig. And, and really to kind of get things going, again, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A or comments for that matter. Um, there is a comment or a question on uh, forever green crops. So Craig obviously just mentioned Kernza is one of those crops. Would you want to kind of briefly go over a couple of those um, that have been in development and then also maybe make a comment or two on kind of where they are in terms of actual commercialization? Um, you know, are they, you know, a year out? Are they 10 years out? Um, some comments in terms of when you see these maybe fitting on a, on a little bit wider scale. Yeah, I, I should first say that um, you might want to go to the, um, just go to Google search or some other search engine and type in Forever Green Initiative, University of Minnesota, and you'll see breakouts and publications on all the different crops. <clears throat> so, um, Kernza is the crop that probably is the farthest along in terms of um, um, putting it out on the landscape and developing a supply chain. Um, and um, I think Yoakum is aware of this for the, 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 the hybrid rye he's talking about. We can grow these crops, all of them, but if we don't have a supply chain, a value chain there that links the field to the market, um, we, we have some issues. And uh, the big, one of the big factors then is the actual pricing of the grain or what a farmer can get for the grain. Um, and um, if you don't have the supply chain, it can be very variable. And I know with the case of Kernza, some people have grown it. Um, <clears throat> one grower I know is Carmen Fernholtz and he's established a market. And um, other, you know, some growers um, established markets. Um, I know Birchwood Cafe buys it from some growers, but that's not going to allow the crop to grow at the scale that is needed to get all the environmental benefits from it and to be widely, you know, grown on the landscape. Other crops in the Forever Green Initiative, uh, there's a hazelnut program, which is fairly far along. And on these, I don't really, to answer your question, Jared, I don't know about where they're at in development, how close they are to market. There's winter camelina. We've heard a lot about that. Uh, there's pennycrest is another one. There's a program on winter barley uh, that um, trying to breed winter, uh, winter barley that'll overwinter. Uh, and as I mentioned um, earlier, there's the winter pea as well as the uh, hairy vetch. And quickly, before I turn it over to Yoakum to, for a response there, um, there is a question from Rochelle Kruzmark here. Does the deep root development of Kernza plug drainage tile? I don't know, Craig or Yoakum have any, any experience there? I know that has been a concern, certainly with some perennial areas. I think that is, um, well, we've promoted Kernza for having these deep roots and to be able to suck up nitrogen. We've promoted it to use at wellhead protection sites. Um, and it's, I would, don't have data on this, but uh, intuitively, I think it could be an issue. Could yeah, I would be. presume just, you know, similar to other perennial, perennial areas. Yeah, it, it could be, be, yeah. Once in a while. Yoakum, any, uh, any response or comments on that? Hey, so Greg brings up this point of the value chain and having price discovery. One of the, you know, farming is risk management. I, I liken to think of farming as not a NASCAR race where you know when the turn is going to come. And, but it's more like 
rally racing that you see in the European circuit, where two guys sit in a car and the co-pilot goes, well, there's a 90 degree turn to the right coming up in about five seconds, and the ravine behind it is about 400 feet deep. I think you can take it at 90 miles an hour if you do it right. Um, so farming is making split second decisions with incomplete information with rather large consequences. That's what farming is. And so you try to manage as much of the risks that you can and one of them, and that's a very important one, is price risk. Because if you have a viable futures market, that means you can look at, okay, I'm paying this for rent, I can pencil this. Now, the challenges with small grains, and that's, I am the first one to admit that, is that for small grains, if it ends up in the food supply, the buyers have relatively strict quality parameters. Why? Because it needs certain functional quality. I've said for years, and it doesn't, it doesn't enamor me, and sometimes I might get tarred and fetter over it, but if it's, num if it's yellow, it's number two corn. If it has a hilum, it's a soybean, okay? That means the likelihood of you actually capturing the futures price to the contract price that you agreed upon, that you penciled everything on, you actually get. And the first sentiment that growers have with barley, spring wheat, doesn't matter, is I got nickel and dimed and I didn't get what I contracted for. Well, the nickel and diming is because of discounts and those discounts come because the functional quality isn't there. Now, that still might not mean that the enterprise in of itself isn't profitable, but it, that's, a psycho, that's a psychology, that's a whole story in of itself. But one of the things that is really important for all these crops to work and to be included in the landscape, not just as a specialty crop on 100 acres here or 200 acres there, if we're really thinking about changing the landscape and the outcomes across the whole landscape, we're talking millions of acres. For millions of acres to work, uh, even if it was hybrid rye, we can't drink that much whiskey. We have other health concerns then. You know, we have, we can't eat that much rye bread. So there has to be viable feed markets. And that's one of the things that, you know, has to happen. There is not for nothing that the saying of the cream of the crop. The reason oats and barley are disappearing is that they no longer have a feed use. They're not competitive in corn. And so the sub because you have substitution. Hybrid rye, because of its yield potential, may actually be a viable substitution for corn and vice versa. That makes that second market, that food feed market, a viable option. That makes it a viable opportunity across the landscape. If you do Camelina, if you do um, Kernza, you have the same problems. You have substitution. Patagonia, and I'll be critical here, Patagonia isn't interested in having a million acres of Kernza. Why? Because then the specialty, their marketing angle disappears. If it gets too expensive because there's not, not enough supply compared to their demand, they're going to do substitution. They're just going to sprinkle a couple of kerns or kernels over the top of that granola bar, use oats that is much cheaper for the remainder, and still call it in their marketing ploy this, you know, kerns of benefit, yada, yada, yada. So you, there's a difference between commodities and the whole, you know, the eight millions of acres that we have and specialty crops. So Joachim, um, if I could just say something um, um, to you. Um, so I think that in the Kernza, uh, that's one of the reasons that Colin and others um, um, are working on this supply chain uh, to, um, 
to provide this reliable market. I want one of the things that you need to be aware of in the, with the hybrid rye, when you go and think about using hybrid rye in the dairy rations or beef rations or livestock, that will be the lowest value that you will get for that commodity because it will be a, and then enter the area of the least cost feed. So watch out for that one. You're better off having a food grade one and using it, using the rye for making more whiskey. I don't know what the No, but is. that's the challenge. The challenge is that, like I said, if you really wanna change the landscape and have millions of acres, not 100,000 acres, because 100,000 acres, believe it or not, is an awful lot of whiskey. Um, and I do my part, but there are limits. To, uh, basically, my liver tells me my limits. Well, we feel that Kernza, because of the fact that it can be used in a number of human food items for baking, has a lot of potential. In addition, straw is produced. You can get four to five tons of straw. You can also graze the forage. So we look at multiple revenue streams from it, in addition to the environmental benefits. But anyways, um, I just want to make that plug. The other thing I should say about Kernza, for those of you who are interested in growing it, is there is a program now to subsidize or support its growth on some acres related to well, how, well um, uh, these areas around wells where you manage the water, uh, the, the crop production. So um, check, go to that website, so. So I would like, since we are after nine o'clock, for those of you who might have other engagements you need to get to, uh, we certainly wanna be respectful of that and allow you to, to get off if you need to. Again, there is a survey uh, as you click leave. Um, if, would you please fill that out, out that three question survey? It's pretty quick and painless. Um, but if not, uh, we do have a number of other questions and comments, so we will keep the conversation going. So you're more than welcome to stay on. Um, as we continue the discussion here. So, you know, I think a lot of the points here is, uh, you know, with these forever green crops, Kernza, all of these, you know, it's not like it's gonna be a replacement for corn or soybean, you know, they obviously have their place and with strategic placement, you know, of any of these crops, I mean, that's really where, you know, I see, you know, the benefit coming, uh, you know, like wellhead protection areas, you know, if we count up all the acres of those areas or other sensitive sites, um, you know, it might not add up to a lot of acreage, but it might have a pretty big impact just because it's, it's placed on very, very specific areas. So, um, you know, that's kind of, kind of where I see a lot of these kind of new crops coming and they might not be a huge number of acres, but they could have a big impact just being placed in the right places. Um, you know, for the sake of, um, you know, the topic here today. So there's a lot of other information, obviously on the, on the forever green crops and, and some of these new in development. Um, the topic today, of course, was uh, third crops ready to go. So, um, you know, some of these crops obviously have a little bit of ways to go, and that's kind of why the university is, is working on those. So um, I guess as moderator to kind of steer us back into some of these crops that are ready to go, you know, Craig, especially on, on the forage crops, um, you know, we talk about winter rye and having to, you know, maybe have a feed source um, really to take anything that might not need, meet food specs or, um, you know, really to get widespread market availability. Um, you know, would you make some comments on some of these other crops that are ready to go? Obviously, livestock is a is a critical component with some of these. You know, even Kernza having some multiple end uses um, with straw and uh, and feed. So, I don't know. You want to make a few comments on on the importance of livestock with some of these crops if we really want to push some diversity. We'll start with Craig and then go to Yoakum. No, that is a uh, that's kind of a a, a deep topic, <laughs> livestock because um, many people feel that for a very healthy soil, for a, a healthy landscape, we need to integrate livestock. We need to take lands that have, where we're currently growing row crops like corn and soybeans, and um, the lands that maybe aren't the best capability classes for those, so capability classes for those those crops and return them to growing livestock. Um, and I do want to say here right now, I'm not trying to eliminate corn or soybean from our landscape. They're very important crops. We need those, but we need to reestablish viable crop rotations. And um, here again, 
let's just talk about beef. Um, there are many, there's cow calf operations, there's fattening operation, you know, there's grass fed beef. And a lot of that, um, a lot of those again are, are, are um, types of um, enterprises that depend on establishing a market for that beef. And uh, how much grass fed beef can we handle um, and um, in, in our existing markets? And uh, so, so those are questions um, to have. And same way with, with dairy, how much milk are we going to get from pastures? How much of that can we handle in our existing supply chain? And right now, uh, <clears throat> if we took, you know, 2 million acres out of the corn and soybean rotation and turn that into uh, to, uh, milk production, you know, it's going to have an impact on the milk price. So um, <clears throat> anyways, those are, those are, that's a response. And I, I can't say beyond that because it's very complex. And someone's thinking out there right now, well, we're subsidizing corn and soybean production. Why don't we subsidize grass-fed beef production? And, uh, you know, so we have to have a, uh, change policy, we have to change legislation to do that, change the farm bill. Yoakum, we'll turn that over to you too, especially keeping in mind for those of you out there that might not know, Yoakum, of course, has a unique background uh, coming from the, the, the Netherlands. So certainly um, things are different uh, in the farming community where you grew up uh, in the Netherlands. So do you want to kind of make some comments on that and yeah. you know, maybe relate back to your, your personal uh, experiences? Okay. So Everybody can see my background. That's basically just across the dike from where our farm was, a couple of miles. And that's actually, this is part of an area that only floods ever so often. This picture was early, taken early in the spring after some spring storms. Um, but the farm we farmed was 500, uh, 500 years old, sea bottom. And I grew up with a rotation that was at a minimum one in four. And the reason for that was a piece of legislation in the 1920s about a critter called the potato cyst nematode that changed our whole farming operation uh, that without actually the science completely being there. Turned out afterwards that was a very good thing to do. Um, and so, But I wanna illustrate with that my whole mindset of rotations was it was longer than two years. When I came to the US, a corn soybean rotation seemed like an oxymoron. I've learned since that corn really is the driver and corn only, like I said, only needs a one year. Most other crops need longer rotations. My grandfather, for instance, uh, when some pointy headed researcher from the university in the Netherlands, uh, from Wageningen, my alma mater said, I wanna find out why you can only grow flax one in seven years. And my grandfather already knew the answer. It's because of a certain soil borne disease that is very persistent in the soil. And they had learned in that 500 years with his, you know, his ancestors that you only grew flax one in seven years. So I've, I've learned to appreciate the corn soybean rotation. Um, but there's a lot of things where technical solutions, we're starting to bang our head against the wall. Uh, and crop rotation then is a solution. And if you talk about two crops that are ready in the system right now, for which there are viable markets, like I talked about before, I think the cereals are it. Hybrid rye, winter wheat, spring wheat, uh, here and there some barley, there's oats, demand for oats, and indeed, if you are in an area with livestock, there is a market for straw. Uh, if you are in an area where there is no livestock, there is no market for straw. Uh, then hauling straw is like carrying water to the sea. Um, doesn't pencil very often. So I think, you know, it's, it's diversification. I think Greg and I have in a way the same message. I, my attention span is probably a little bit shorter than Greg in the sense that I, and that's part of is my job is to look at the here and now. Uh, and the here and now we have already options that you can, we can roll out right now. 
in the case of hybrid rye, we're still learning things. Um, but, you know, I think they're viable. Um, now, there's a question here from Jim Finnegan. How do we change the mindset for seed companies to, that only want non-PVP varieties? Uh, so, so, in the case of winter rye, um, I make the distinction between rye as a grain crop versus rye as a cover crop. Biomass-wise, there isn't all that much difference between the old ones like Ryman or even older ones uh, like Elbon. Um, they both grow, they both produce biomass. There's small differences, but in the way we treat them currently where they get established late and get terminated early, those differences are mi minute. The differences really come in uh, for grain yield and then the more modern uh, rise and the more adapted ones have higher yield potential. Uh, Ryman, Danko, Hazlitt are probably the three open pollinated varieties that don't have a PVP that do the best. Um, the hybrids are a completely different ballgame. Those I would never use for cover crop because they're too expensive. And you're going to use something that is variety non-stated. Anything that is, looks like rye is good enough. Uh, but once you start using it for and, and intending it as a grain crop, the, the game changes and then the hybrids far out yield um, and have much better agronomics than any of the older stuff, open varieties, open pollinated varieties. Does that answer it, Jared? Yeah, no, I think so. And I kind of a follow up. There was a question earlier that you had answered in the Q&A. Uh, regarding double cropping. I think it probably is worth mentioning too. You know, Craig showed some photos earlier of, of some horses grazing cover crops. And this certainly will be a topic at our small grain workshops on really the, the growth habit of small grains, whether they're spring or winter, you know, we can harvest them earlier. So obviously we get a lot better uh, period of time, some growing season, some growing degree days left to actually get cover crops established if we want to, which certainly if you have livestock to feed or graze, it, it makes uh, very good sense. Um, you know, just speaking from experience, you know, the last few years that that the field of wheat behind me in my virtual background, um, you know, it's not a lot of acres, but the biggest reason we grow a little bit of wheat is just to be able to plant a cover crop and have a little bit of grazing value later in the fall. Uh, we don't have quite enough pasture to, to feed all of our cows. So it's nice to have that, that, uh, that cover crop to graze in the fall. So it's kind of hard to attribute value to that. So there is a little bit more flexibility with uh, you know, these small grain or other crop systems just based on not having to use the entire growing season. But obviously, you know, in, in, in systems without livestock, you know, there is this question that comes up a lot about double cropping. So Joachim, you want to make some comments there? And then Craig, if you have any follow-ups uh, on this double cropping uh, idea. So I work with one cooperator in Southern Min, and depending on how the winter wheat comes off, how early, uh, because there's a little bit of variation, uh, he grows winter wheat most years. Um, he will divert part of the acres to sorghum sedan for forage that he uses in his uh, fattening operation. He, he makes silage out of it at the end of the season, gets about four tons of silage off sorghum sedan. And sometimes he decides to put a very early maturity soybeans. And he can get, if, if the fall cooperates, uh, and he doesn't get an early frost, he looks at about 30 bushels of, of beans, double crop. It's, it's not a foolproof, but it's possible. And if indeed climate change trends the way that is predicted, that becomes more and more feasible. Where if the, if the, the first killing frost gets later and later, double cropping, following, and basically doing what in parts of Pennsylvania, parts of Ohio, parts of Indiana has been a very standard operation of um, following, you know, basically winter wheat with soybeans. Um, double cropping soybeans is a viable option. It, the risk with that is fusarium head blight. And so I, I like to flip them around 
as a management tool for Viserium head bite, but we can talk about that. Um, and so there, there is options. If we, and Greg brings up another point, and if we really look down, down into the future about diversifying, you know, I talked about economies of scale, which is why we do what we do currently do. And Greg made the argument that we really should have livestock back into our systems. Um, and there's another reason for that. Um, and it might mean a different way of organizing our businesses. Right now, phosphorus is brought in. When phosphorus fertilizer becomes too cost prohibitive to bring in because others are buying it or the supply is dwindling, the only way you can get phosphorus back in your system is to concentrate the plant available phosphorus through an animal. It's called manure. That means that we have to diversify back into livestock. Now it might mean that we have pods of livestock in a 10 mile radius uh, that basically distribute you know, every 10 miles, a very you know highly specialized uh, livestock producer, whether that's chickens, turkeys, but that manure then supplies the phosphorus in a 10 mile radius because hauling manure is like hauling straw. It's carrying water to the sea. And so you, it becomes an issue of logistics. We use phosphorus fertilizer because it's concentrated and we can bring it in much cheaper than we can haul manure around right now. But if that disappears, and those are conversations that are happening when we run out of you know, the mine in Florida, for instance, and we have to get it out of Morocco or Brazil, um, that changes how we have to, again, apply fertilizer to our corn. That changes our whole, our whole how we organize our operations. Greg, you want to, now I'm really, you know, strategic now, you know, 60 there, years there, down the road. Yeah, but Jochen, there's an analogous situation. Um, in the 1900s, really up to the World War II, farmers really depended on legume nitrogen, biological nitrogen fixation to supply nitrogen in crop rotation. Then what happened? We had the development of the anhydrous ammonia uh, industry, and that had totally replaced um, legume nitrogen, and um, that it because it was it was such a game changer. Uh, and by the way, that whole process was developed to make make um, a nitrogen and you know ammonia for um, making munitions in Germany during World War One. But be be that as it may, it's here and it's a source of cheap nitrogen. You cannot grow a legume and value that legume nitrogen to compete with that synthetic nitrogen. So um, the only other thing I would want to say to this, uh, um, Yoakum, is that, <clears throat> and you've already mentioned it, but double cropping, I like the idea, but it's risky business. And uh, how, many, how many failures will a grower be able to sustain at the back end of the double crop in order to um, and keep it going. They'll give it up in Minnesota, but climate's changing. I will say one of the uh, kind of tips with the whole double cropping scenario is when you're planting soybeans that late, uh, you don't pay full price for seed. Um, that basically, you know, once soybean seed isn't used in the spring, you know, it basically goes to the elevator. So um, obviously the cost of that soybean seed certainly, and the cost system there uh, does change quite a bit. Um, in some cases, uh, I think, at least one that I know of actually gets basically replant seed because um, he works the system just right. But um, then we do have another question uh, based on straw value. So um, anybody have a, a comment um, on, uh, you know, straw value, obviously small grain systems, whether it's, you know, spring or winter wheat or rye uh, or the Kernza system, you know, there is some straw, basically low quality, real low quality, quality forage there. Um, do either of you have any insight into to straw values? I, I don't. I don't keep track of the hay auction at Sauk, at Sauk Center. That's probably our best gauge 
for what straw values are at. Um, you know, we don't have cellulose ethanol. That would be a demand, could create a demand for, for straw. Um, the other thing is, and this is wanes and, and, and it goes back and forward, industrial applications of straw for uh, building materials, uh, straw board, not just cardboard, but uh, construction materials. There's a plants that pop up and then they disappear. Uh, right now, there's a fair, fairly healthy demand for straw uh, other than for livestock going somewhere in the valley because I see uh, huge stacks of uh, big bales of straw this past season. Um, with the value of a straw, I'm always the first to point out that um, you are removing uh, organic matter that has a cost and you have the nutrient removal. And so you have to look at what the nutrient removal is. That's the easiest way to calculate it. And then uh, as far as organic removal, organic matter removal, uh, we have some models that show how much you can remove and stay, maintain your soil health and maintain your organic matter over time. We, we can partially remove straw and create value. Um, that's, and, and those models are there. Craig? No, I don't have anything to add. So. I just sold some straw on Monday and I got 30 bucks a bale. <laughs> They're not, uh, you know, straw market, in my opinion, is one of those that's just so unpredictable. <clears throat> you know, anybody you talk to that, that, that produces straw, at least occasionally, it, it seems like it's one of those where when you bale straw, it's not worth very much. And when you don't, that's when it goes up to $120 a ton and is pretty valuable. So it is, it is one that's tough to quantify. So, you know, in my opinion, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenging one to really rely on, but it is one that depending on the year, you can certainly be money ahead, even if you do um, attribute value to, um, you know, nutrient removal and those types of things. The, the most interesting one that I know of is Straw is a producer just south of the cities. He bales idiot blocks and sells them into the Twin Cities. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a gold mine for him. But, but he has the contacts and you know, has the channels and the straw in that case is way more worth than his grain. I think that's a good example, really to start wrapping up the session for today that you know, a lot of these third crops, you know, aside from you know, even in the, in the wheat markets, you know, it, it does take some creativity even to, to get them marketed. It might take you hauling, hauling those crops quite a ways. So you know, it, it does take a little bit more work um, you know, but my opinion, it, it kind of makes things a little bit more enjoyable too. There is a lot more flexibility in terms of what you can do, um, you know, to make these systems work. We do have a comment I wanted to point out. Uh, thanks, Ryan, uh, from Ryan Miller down in the southeast part of the state, my co colleague down in Rochester. Uh, he said that they did some work on double crop soybeans and uh, basically following the processing pea, uh, pea field. Uh, there certainly is some processing peas in that area. Uh, basically, if you plant them by July 4th, you get about half crop of, of soybeans and uh, maybe about a five to seven bushel decrease uh, each week later. So obviously, once you push into July, things things degrade pretty rapidly. But, um, you know, and I would say that that's on par with uh, with some of the folks that I know that have that have done this following um, following a, a winter wheat or rye crop um, as well. It's one of those things that, you know, it's kind of like the straw. It's not going to work every year, but but some years it works out and you know, the worst case scenario in that system, you know, your soybeans were, were pretty cheap to get established and they end up uh, really being kind of a cover crop in that system. So before we kind of wrap things up for the day, um, uh, I guess I'll start with uh, Craig and then go to Yoakum, but do you guys have any other last comments, uh, kind of parting comments to summarize uh, the session today and, and really uh, kind of kind of some tips, I guess? Uh, I'm doing so. Uh, Craig, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to to say that when, as we were having this discussion about double cropping, I know that Aaron Lorenz is, um, is working on breeding a shorter season um, soybean that may fit well into the double cropping. So um, it, it appears to me that um, in, in summary that, and I started with my first slide on alfalfa, 
when I first came here 40 years ago, we had 3 million acres of alfalfa in Minnesota. And I think now we're down to a million. We were very much tied to and still are tied to the livestock industry, the dairy industry. And we um, are also uh, vulnerable in terms of the, the new mixed rations, least cost ingredients. Uh, alfalfa still is very important. So, but whenever we talk about crops, new ones or old ones, the ones that come and go, it really revolves around. Much of our discussion is about markets. What are you gonna do with the stuff you grow? And everybody needs to think of that as they go into these new, new crops or new procedures. Good point, Joachim, any parting comments, uh, tips? Well, Ryan wanted to know how much whiskey I can get off an acre um and i did the math quick we're at least at 1500 bottles uh per acre so it you don't need a lot to get an awful lot of whiskey i will say though working on on rye and uh, barley certainly has its perks because there's always uh, some whiskey and beer involved so just saying you see my smile <laughs> You've even had a, a whiskey tasting project, haven't you, Yoko? Yeah. So, so one of the side projects, because the, the, the way I got back into to rye uh, was very simple. I was asked which one, if we're going to sell cover crop seed, which is the one that produces the most seed? Um, because I have to produce the seed if I want to sell it. Um, and that really sparked my interest in hybrid rye because I knew the Germans and there's two... German companies and one Polish company that have hybrids uh, across Europe really sparked my question to see, okay, are these hybrids winter hardy enough for us? And they are, they fit very well. And so that's how this whole thing started. Um, and as I did that, a micro distiller contacted me and said, would there be differences in flavor similar to um, what we do with grapes? And is there differences depending on where I grow them? Uh, and one thing led to another. And so um, we've grown out a number of these open pollinated and hybrid rice. Uh, we've distilled them on a large still. And then we did taste tests. And th this is white whiskey. This isn't the finished product. So this is moonshine. White whiskey is nothing, is a nice name for, for moonshine. I can tell you, as the one, one of the ones that I tasted, tasted like geraniums. Uh, one of them tasted like really bad tequila. And some of them were relatively mild and, and mild mannered. That actually doesn't necessarily translate to a finished project, uh, the way the whiskeys are gonna taste in the end. Uh, that's a whole field of chemistry uh, that's really interesting where, and it's basically the head of the whiskey when you started still up, it's the first part that comes off the still that eventually will react with the sugars in the wood and other phenols that are in the wood that give the final flavor profile. Uh, and uh, he has one now, unfortunately it's with, a, and I won't tell you the variety, it's one of the varieties that isn't great for producing grain that apparently gives an absolutely amazing uh, whiskey uh, that has a really unique flavor profile. So there is differences and they're quantifiable and they're repeatable. And so having varieties sold by name, by of having whiskey, a uh, rye sold by name uh, might happen. Um, Whiskey distillers in the past basically worked with mostly variety non-stated. They had no idea. And these micro distillers are really looking at, okay, how can we add value again? And they're looking at this idea of treating it like wine where you have varietal differences and different, different end products. The one with the geraniums wasn't very good. That I can believe. So to wrap things up, any, uh, any parting comments, Joachim? I kind of got you sidetracked there right at the end. Yeah, you just... 
<laughs> Even though it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Um, no, if there are more questions, uh, I'll stay on, t type them in. I'll try to answer the ones, that, the open questions in the q and I'll type and those answers in and we'll go from there. And otherwise just email me. Yeah, so, you know, I do thank you guys all for attending today. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Dr. Craig Schaefer, as well as Dr. Joachim Wiersma. If you have any questions for us and would like to, to learn more details on any of these things, feel free to, to reach out. It's pretty easy to find our emails uh, online. Um, so feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions. Uh, again, if you have questions or would like to attend our virtual small grain workshops coming up uh, in uh, two weeks, um, feel free to, to register. That link uh, was put in the chat earlier on today, but or you can uh, just Google U of M small grain workshops and, and we'll go into a lot more detail uh, in terms of the specific management. Uh, if you have questions, want to get us sidetracked on rye whiskey tasting or beer tasting, um, unfortunately we can't offer samples this year being in a virtual format, but, uh, but we'd be happy to have you. So again, there's a very quick short uh, three question survey when you hit leave today, please uh, do fill that out, give us some feedback. And again, want to uh, give out a big thanks to our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn uh, Research and Prom Promotion Council. We do have sessions again next week and for the upcoming weeks. Next week, we have a title of We've Got You Covered, the latest on cover crop research and tools you can use. So really a more in-depth conversation on the cover crop side of things with Axel Garcia, Anna Cates, and Greg Johnson. With that, I thank you for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>